Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the American Enterprise Institute. My name is Ryan Streeter. I'm the director of the Domestic Policy Studies Program here, and it's my pleasure to welcome you for uh, this event today, a very timely one, in my view, and I think in yours as well. And I'm looking forward to hearing from, from all of our speakers. Um, today's event is called Saving the Liberal Arts, Bridging the Divide Between Education and Employment. And it fits nicely here at AEI with a number of activities that we're engaged in, which we um, band together under the banner of the Human Dignity Project, which is essentially a, a, a recognition here at AEI that a lot of our public policy reform and the research that supports it um, needs to be focused on helping everyone, uh, regardless of their station in life, uh, pursue their aspirations and fulfill their potential. And I think it's pretty well known that our institutions of higher education don't always um, do what they should to provide the on-ramp to the careers that people are aspiring to, and that we can do better. And too many people lose out, and so that's why today's event is, is very timely, um, bridging the divide between education and employment by saving the liberal arts. And so uh, what I'd like to do is introduce um, the two authors of our report that came out today under this name and our moderator, and then um, I'll, I'll leave the introduction of the panel that follows to the moderator of that panel, Jeff Salingo. Um, just a few uh, housekeeping items. Um, please make sure your cell phones are turned off, and when we do come to Q&A, um, be sure to identify yourself by name and institution if you have one, and then also try to make your questions as succinct as possible. Um, this event is being live streamed, and the full video will be posted online um, after we conclude within 24 hours. So let me, let me uh, turn this uh, over uh, just by way of short introduction to our moderator, uh, Goldie Blumenstick, who's a reporter and editor at the Chronicle of Higher Education and has been there for more than 25 years covering pretty much every aspect of higher education and higher education policy. And so those of you who are into this subject uh, uh, know her. she's a household name to you. Our two authors today are Mark Schneider and Matthew Sigelman. Uh, Mark Schneider, to my far right, is a visiting scholar here at the American Enterprise Institute. He's also a vice president at the American Institutes <clears throat> for Research and a president of College Measures. Um, he has also served as the commissioner of the National Center for Education Statistics from 2005 to 2008, and he is the author of numer numerous articles and books on education policy. Matthew Sigelman is the CEO of Burning Glass Technologies. It's a, it's a leading uh, labor market analytics firm, and for more than a decade, he's led Burning Glass um, using artificial intelligence and data to help people f um, find, and f uh, find employment and fill jobs that the market's demand. <coughs> Burning Glass data drive initiatives for more than a dozen state and national governments, as well as educational institutions and major employers. And so with that, uh, I'd like you to join me in welcoming our discussants today, and I'll turn it over to you, Goldie. Thanks very much, Roy. Morning, everybody. I, I don't know how familiar people are with the um, paper we're, or papers that we're discussing today. There's a, papers on, there's a paper on the associate's, of, um, associate's degree, and there's a paper on the bachelor's degree, and I don't know how, at what stage all these papers are in terms of being um, published. So we're going to be talking about both of these, but perhaps more critically about one than the other. Um, <clears throat> I, I'm very, by the way, these two gentlemen are sort of household names that, in my life, so it's very honored. I'm very honored today to have them on, be on the panel here with them. In, in one of the papers, I'll give a little spoiler, in the, in the uh, bachelor's paper, there is this discussion a little bit about the decline in majors in religious studies and some of the other liberal arts studies, um, ethnic studies, and I guess by way of over introduction, I point out that given the state of the world these days, you can't help feel that maybe we should have a few more people studying religious studies and studying ethnic studies because that's certainly the source of a lot of conflict and strife in our world today. Um, I'm going to start this off by asking um, both Mark and Matt to give us a, like a quick overview of this. I kind of uh, blithely described it yesterday as kind of dollop of coding, you know, save the liberal arts. That was a little glib. Um, but maybe um, you guys could talk a little bit um, with some actual meat on the bones about what you what you found in these two papers. Um, Mark, why don't you go first? So um, I'm going to talk about the paper that actually has been published, and that's the, AA, the paper about the AA degree. So just to give some background on this, uh, uh, so Ryan noted that I run a company called College Measures, which is actually a, a division of the American Institutes for Research. And uh, basically, for uh, eight years now, we've been working with state governments that have merged their uh, information about college students uh, and very simple information, what program they graduated from, what institution that program was housed in, 
and um, and what year they graduated, and and they've and states have merged these data with uh, unemployment insurance wage data. So we know how much uh, a, a fairly large percentage of students, especially in uh, community colleges, uh, a fairly large percentage of students uh, are earning at one, five, ten years after completing a degree or credential, right? So in, in every state that we work in, we get all the public institutions. In some states, we get the private institutions as well. And we get every, um, every credential going from certificates to bachelor's, to associate degrees, to bachelor's degrees, to master's degrees, uh, et cetera. And um, so we've done a series of papers on, um, on the, the outcomes of these uh, degrees. The first state that we did was Arkansas and, and then followed by Virginia and Tennessee. And the same results came up in all these states. And at the time, this is uh, you know, probably 2012, the, the, the results came out and I went to the PR person in my, at AIR and I said, look at these results. I'm like, I don't believe them. And, and he said, I don't believe me either, but they're so consistent. And the result was that AA students were earning more than um, associate students, not AA, I want to come back to that in a second. Associates, students with associate degrees were out earning, on average, bachelor's degrees. And like, how could this be? So went back and checked the data, went back to the states, checked the data, and it turned out to be the case, right? So that was a puzzlement, and then we did two things. We started de disaggregating the, the wage data for associate degrees into AA, AAS, AS, and it turned out, of course, that the AS and the AAS graduates were the ones that were driving these, the high earnings, and the AA ones were at the bottom. And then we disaggregated it more into the programs of study because all the data that we have is built around individual program graduates, and it turned out that, not, lo and behold, not surprisingly, we could continually identify and consistently identify the kind of AA um, um, associate degrees that were uh, creating high market value. We did the same thing for credential, uh, for uh, certificates, and identified the certificates that have high value. We then got longitudinal data, and a lot of a lot of these er high earnings in year one, repeat in year five, and re uh, repeat in year ten. We did uh, ROI calculations, and a very consistent pattern comes up. However. However, almost half of the students getting associate degrees are getting AA degrees, Associates of Arts degrees, and uh, almost all of those are getting a degree in one particular program, uh, Liberal Arts General Studies and Humanities. Okay. So we know that those programs are designed as transfer programs. That's the purpose of them, the general education, two years and then you're supposed to transfer. 80 some odd percent of students in those programs say that they, they intend to transfer. But there's a total disconnect between the 80 percent that say they want to transfer, intend to transfer, and the percentages of students that actually do transfer. So what the paper... Let's, let's cut to the chase, Mark. Okay, let's cut to the chase. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, you know, I, w w once you give Professor me a stage... Professor Schneider, let's cut to the chase. Yeah, once you give me a stage, I got to talk. Uh, so, the, so the bottom line is that students are ending up with a general education, two-year degree, transfer-oriented degree, and they're in, ending up in the job market. So the work that we've been doing with Burning Glass is identifying the kinds of skills that could be added to an associate's degree that would create market value for that degree. Punchline. Punchline. Great. <laughs> Matt, tell us a little bit about the, 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 the secret report. The secret <laughs> report on liberal arts. Um, and so um, the second report looks at the part of the liberal arts spectrum that most of us tend to identify with liberal arts, which is bachelor's level programs. Um, but the structure of the findings in some ways are very similar. Um, liberal arts, of course, have been this kind of flashpoint in the overall debate over the future structure of American higher education, uh, with on the other, on one hand, um, advocates pointing to um, the tremendous value um, and the growing value in the foundational skills that are, that are built through a traditional liberal arts program. Employers um, struggle increasingly to find people with critical thinking skills, with creativity skills, with communication skills, all the things that are sort of the bedrock of a traditional liberal arts um, uh, education, which should give tremendous value to that part of our educational heritage. Um, at the same time, we know, uh, you know that the, the actual outcomes for people who are in liberal arts degrees 
are stark. Um, that is to say that uh, we know that rates of underemployment for uh, liberal arts graduates um, are, are high. Um, about a, uh, liberal arts grads start out earning about 25% less uh, than their peers and other majors. Um, they do catch up a little bit faster, but continue to lag um, even five years out. Um, they, are, uh, they have the lowest median income of any set of majors. And so the question is, um, you know, what do you do about this? So there's a lot of baby with a bathwater talk about uh, the Vocation liberal arts. We should just talk about vocational schools. Exactly. <laughs> uh, we should all go and get an associate's in science degree um, and, and pursue those kinds of careers. Um, and yet, again, um, all the, the arguments for why um, in, an, a, in, in a tech-driven future, um, liberal arts skills are more valuable. So we looked at um, how, do you, um, how do you get past the lazy debate uh, around um, vocational versus liberal arts and figure out how do you actually uh, define a set of jobs that are accessible to liberal arts majors that grow the number of opportunities that are, uh, and, and unlock opportunities for liberal arts majors and unlock additional earning incomes. Just to put one last uh, figure on it, um, what we found was that um, we could in fact, we, we identified essentially 10 sets of career areas that um, have substantial numbers of jobs that could be open to people uh, at the entry level without specialized degrees. Um, so the kinds of uh, degrees that liberal arts uh, majors earn, philosophy, religion, uh, ethnic studies, um, and which um, wind up having sort of long-term earnings potential um, that is um, at least on par with um, college majors overall, and in many cases on par with or even in, in excess of STEM majors. So one thing I've been wondering about with this um, it, it, Really, where, what's, what's, where's, where, where's, been, where's the movement been? Is this a, cha is this a 20 year change in the labor, in the labor market? In the way the, or is this the way we're, we're, was this always happening? We never quite understood it. Um, my sense is I remember a time, and you know, my fellow history majors coming out of college were recruited by the big eight accounting firms, and they got trained for two years and had to have a career in, in not just accounting, but sort of consulting and all these other fields. And obviously, that doesn't happen anymore. Um, similarly, it feels like there's some changes happening at the associate, associate degree level that seems a little bit better refined. Has the, market, has the labor market changed that much, or has education changed? I, I think the, um, the labor market has certainly changed in, in a number of ways. I think there's a number. So first of all, obviously, um, you know, there's the old expression that a rising tide floats all boats, and I think there was always sort of um, a general view that as long as not that many people were um, entering into... Uh, bachelor's level programs or, or pursuing post-secondary uh, education in any level, um, then at some level that sort of provided a signaling mechanism that was valuable in and of itself. But increasingly what we're seeing is that the job market has moved not so much by jobs as by skills. Um, and in that kind of market where employers have significant demand um, not only for foundational skills, um, but for technical skills, um, they do expect that, that students will come job ready on day one. That's also exacerbated um, by a um, millennial workforce who um, turn over very quickly. So if you're an employer, um, you know, it, we, can, we can step into the subjunctive mood and talk about what they ought and should do. <laughs> Um, but arts education. if we understood what a subjective was, <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, somebody in my educational history would be proud. Um, <laughs> but um, the reality is that for an employer who um, can only expect that uh, a worker is going to be there for a pretty short tenure, um, expecting that they will make major investments in training um, aren't particularly realistic. So employers have come to demand that people have those skills, both the foundational skills and the technical skills. And one other um, sort of cultural, um, sort of secular trend, rather, in the job market that I think is really important. We've seen overall a trend toward what I'll call hybridization of skills, um, essentially skills merging um, in, or, or sets of skills that are uh, orthogonal to one another. Um, in other words, ones that you wouldn't expect in a certain domain, sort of getting infused. So um, marketing jobs overall are not hard to fill, but marketing people 
who have uh, the ability to build and query a database as everything gets to be custom, you know, database marketing. Um, right brain, left brain, my left hand, right hand. Um, <laughs> um, those are those right people brain. are really hard to find, and so that need for people to balance between the two is coming to be um, a major force in the market. So could, could I just add yeah, please. to that? So um, I have this title of a paper, which I, I've tried to attach to every paper I've done in the last month, the last <laughs> two months, and it's called It's Skills, Stupid. And, uh, and, and so the thing about listening uh, to Matt's discussion is that the word skills is repeated over and over and over and over and over. It is, and I think that the, the signal change that's going on in the, in the labor market, and again, you know, I learned a lot of this from looking at the burning glass data, is that there are identifiable skills, and many of them are technical, that can be and should be merged with, the traditional, with more traditional kinds of education that will, in fact, have monetary value. So one of the things that we've done in the states that I work with with college measures is that we've taken burning glass data. So you could go to Launch My Career FL, Florida, FL.org, and you can see what we've done. We have a skills picker, and this is a field specific. You could find a field of study from a, so you could look for a bachelor's degree, for example, in business administration from Florida Atlantic University. Uh, and you could see that the expected earnings for a graduate with a plain vanilla degree in, in business administration would be, I'm going to make these numbers up, but make $60,000. But if you, and then there are a list of the most marketable high demand skills, and a student, a, a, a user could click on one of those skills, and it shows how much more the expected earnings are for that person with that degree mastering that skill. And in, in, and in some cases, it's $20,000, $25,000. And you know, so we're, we, what we've tried to do in, in uh, Launch My Career, and we did this in Florida, Colorado, Tennessee, uh, in Texas, what we've used is burning glass data to monetize the skills to show how adding a specific skill to your traditional degree program would, would change your, your, uh, your ROI and your earnings. So the message that we have been, uh, especially for liberal arts, uh, mm -hmm. and we've been working with, uh, on this with states for several years now, is like if you want to major in ethnic studies or whatever, you know, especially for traditional liberal arts, if you want to major in that, if that's your passion, that's okay. But A, you should know that you're going to end up with low wages, right? And here are some skills that you, that are, that you could master, squeeze them, put them, add them to your, your studies, and, and you all of a sudden go from $35,000 to fifty. dollars what's, what's the best way to signal that? I mean, that's the other, I mean, you, Matt, you do, you do a lot of work about the number of certificates that people have out there that, are, that have no right. value. Um, so, I mean, and maybe the second panel will get into this a little bit as well, but I know we have this whole discussion now about credentials and credential engines and com credential companies. Um, I mean, what, is there a, this, should this be, I guess, without getting into like yeah. picking, I'm not saying pick a platform, but should it be part of the degree? Should it be part of the education? I, I actually think it, it does. I think um, this is something where colleges themselves can play a very significant role in improving the outcomes for their students. I think, again, part of the lazy debate has been this kind of um, um, mental space of saying, hey, look, we're not uh, training students for their first job. We're training them for the 20th job. But of course, all the longitudinal data show us that um, students who um, get a, a poor first job tend to lag behind um, permanently. Um, so that is a significant problem. And to your point, Goldie, um, you know, the, the enrollments, even as there's been a, a um, really significant increase in bachelor's level enrollments overall, um, the percentage of conferrals in the liberal arts and humanities has been plummeting, uh, down 25% in some fields. Uh, like history, 22% in English. And so there's an imperative for schools. And here's how they can um, uh, you know, sort of affect this. In some ways, I see a parallel with uh, the guided pathways movement in the uh, community college world, uh, where we realize that if we want to be able to help um, uh, you know, first generation college goers um, and, um, and others persist and ultimately achieve success, we need to be able to mark those paths. 
um, and part of saving the liberal arts and protecting uh, the liberal arts and the core academic program is to make sure that students um, have some signposts about what they can do to supplement um, that fabulous academic core. So, for example, um, what are the minors that may help me get to where I need to go? What is the, um, uh, how do I develop for my students co-op or other work-based learning programs, point them toward internships that will help them accrue those skills? Um, and how do I even similarly signpost not only for my students but for employers um, that somebody who may have earned that feminist anthropology degree um, still has skills that she can take to the bank. So for example, um, if that student is aiming toward an HR career, um, you know, the school may say, hey, look, we're not going to provide HR coursework. It's not, our, it's not our business. We're a liberal arts institution. And they may be right. Um, but um, there are no doubt packages of uh, non-departmental courses that can be pieced together. So for example, in that case, um, you know, if that student, in addition to taking her feminist anthropology courses, takes you know, history 226, which is a history of the, of the labor movement, um, and um, you know, poli sci 228, which is you know, statistical research or survey research, and, and, uh, you know, and, and an org theory class, um, that can be actually a powerful signal if the school can actually call that out, not only as a pathway to the student, but also as something uh, that employers can recognize. I, I, I just have one other question before I go to questions from the audience. How does this work in reverse? What about a student who has been in, uh, I've been doing a lot of research the last couple months on adult students right. and sort of the adult, you know, a lot of the adults come back to college in a certificate program or in a Vero Now or training program. Yet you're talking a lot about the value in the, in the market for these foundational skills, for the liberal arts skills that our employers also really value. How, do, how, do you, how does this work back in another way? Is there an approach that colleges need to take to make sure that their skills program, their very narrow, narrowly ta tailored programs, also include a lot of? So we know, we know that a lot of students with bachelor's degrees, master's degrees, even PhDs are, are showing back up in community colleges for technical training. Right, and we know that there's been rapid growth in the in certificates, um, and you know that those certificates are granted by and not cert certification with different discussion, but the certificates are are being granted there, you know, by community colleges, and we could track. So we know what the wage outcomes are for all these certificate programs, and again, not not surprising what the what the rank order of them is. So right now, those certificates, which are narrowly focused on sets of skills. Mm -hmm. Are, uh, have high value. I think your more general question is, are we, are, can we get to a different place, like Credential Engine or whatever, that will allow certification of skills independent of the traditional kinds of studies? Well, I guess I'm really asking is, if you, you can calculate the value of a, someone with an with a associate's degree plus, what about the other way around? Is it still valuable for the student who has the specialized skill to get the full, so to get the full um, course of study from whatever we're calling the liberal arts program. Um, I mean, how valuable is that to the employers? So um, I think that's a, um, that's, that's incredibly the important. Keeping the stack. Yeah, yeah. No, the, the stack is incredibly important. And, and here's how we know. Uh, we've done a lot of research looking at not only the demand um, for technical skills, and Mark is absolutely right that it's the skills stupid, um, but those skills also include the foundational skills. And when we look at we collect millions of job postings every day and, and look at what are employers actually asking for. Not what are the skills an industrial organizational psychologist said that it takes to do a job, but what, what are the things that employers are pounding the table about. What we found is that, first of all, about 35% of all the skills that employers um, reference are foundational skills, not technical skills. That's even true in um, the most technical different, uh, disciplines, like engineering and computer science and other uh, fields of the job market. But what was even more interesting to us in the research that we've done is that um, employers perceive um, even uh, it, it, skill gaps that are at least as painful to them in finding people with foundational skills as with technical skills. And that was surprising, because when you think about the skills gap, you think about um, a shortage of welders or cybersecurity experts or whatever it may be. And those can indeed be significant skill gaps. But what we found is that we, we looked at where are employers overemphasizing things relative to um, the sort of um, role that they were playing doing the job. 
um, in, in, in industrial organizational profiles. And we found that because what em employers overemphasize tends to be the things that they feel they're not going to get. You don't say, I'm looking for an attorney, must have a JD. You can take that as an assumption. Um, you talk about the things you're not going to find. And what we found is that employers um, pound the table about, um, hard, about soft skills. Um, and interestingly, again, just as liberal arts students often miss the technical skills, that there's just a couple of skills that separate them from opportunity, what we find is that um, where employers um, get most vocal is often in fields where those soft skills are um, important to doing the job, but they're not how we typically define the job. So for example, um, you don't see, uh, you know, where we saw some of the biggest pain points around writing and communication skills were in STEM fields. Um, and so... Well, I'm, I'm thinking of a machinist I spoke to who works for the <laughs> GE plant up in, up in uh, New Hampshire that's working with Northeastern right now. Mm -hmm. He needs to, he wants to get promoted. He can't get promoted now. He's an excellent machinist. He can't get promoted until he hits yeah. his BA. So I'm, you know, it does, mm -hmm. I'm just thinking about the way it works both ways. Yeah, but, but I, 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 two things though. So the, why does he need a BA I'm as with, compared to certifying the skills? Because he, they want him to be a manager. He yeah, wants but, to be but, a manager. But you see, this is the, the that's emphasis how the, on credentials rather than on skills, right? So that's, I mean, so right now the world is like the, the credential is like a sort of vague signal, a noisy signal that you have the skills. Okay. So then the question is, is there a future You're thinking, in which is it just skills? a job line? Is it just a line on the exactly. GE, GE requirements must have BA? To exactly. Get this exactly. Well, I mean, in this case, he's actually not paying for it because he's paying, GE's paying for it. So they obviously see some value in it. So, I mean, either he, you know, I guess if he thought there was value in it, he'd pay for it. In this case, GE is paying for it, so they see some value in it. But I think actually that, that speaks to some of the opportunity um, that I'm sure the panelists and the next panel are going to get to. Uh, we see some really progressive institutions that have made um, associate's degrees very uh, valuable. And part of the way they've done that is make sure that they aren't just defining them around a single skill. Um, even in the most technical programs that they offer, they're really building um, a comprehensive stack because that's what it takes for people to not only land a job but to have ongoing income, uh, income and career mobility. Okay, so it's the jobs stupid, and I'm going to stick. No, skill stupid. It's a skill stupid. <laughs> My word is stack. What's your word? Um, ROI. ROI, okay. Um, what's your word out there? Folks, um, who's, anybody have some questions? Oh, what a surprise. There are questions from the audience. <laughs> um, I, I, I think someone's going to come with a microphone. So, Look, someone came with a microphone. Hello, Alexandria Radford of RTI International. I'm wondering, uh, Mark, if you could speak a little about how often students are actually going to the website and using the information <laughs> about what the wages will be and what the benefits of acquiring extra skills would be and what work has been done about the extent to which it's influencing the choices that they're making. And if not the students, are advisors at least using this information and trying to get it to the students? So the, this, is, this is a, so th this is a giant problem, right? So this is like, uh, I, I, this is retail politics at, at its hardest, right? So we have, we started, uh, again, many years ago with the, you know, the field of dreams, build it, they'll come. And of course that didn't work. Um, and, it, and so the most successful partnerships that we've been able to develop are in the state of Tennessee, where, um, where we've partnered with many community-based organizations. And that, that was extremely valuable in terms of driving, uh, in terms of driving this kind of information into the hands of intermediaries, right? So the, you know, so this whole thing about intermediaries versus disintermediated information flows is something that, you know, we actually don't know, you know, the extent to, I mean, we track usage and all this, we, but we don't know what the, the future in terms of disintermediated versus intermediaries. So we, you know, maybe we're, we're, we're still backwards looking, you know, so we're working with, you know, we're working with intermediaries rather well, than... you work with NCAN for one, right? We work with NCAN, we work with mentors. Which is an advising organization. Yeah, so we work with, uh, so in Tennessee, our tool is distributed through men, the mentors that are part of the Tennessee Promise program. We work with, you know, so Tennessee now has Tennessee Reconnect for adult students coming back. We've done, you know, collateral information for the mentors, for the adult students, for the, you know, for young, younger students coming in to, through Tennessee Promise. It is, it, it is the hardest thing that we've ever tried to do. And, and I'm not anywhere near as su successful as we hoped. 
Um, but I, the other piece of information that, uh, that is related to this is that the Gallup study about the use of career centers is even more discouraging <laughs> than, than you know, our problems because these career centers, you know, so very few students use the career centers and as many students who use them don't like them and found them unuseful as found them useful. So this is, I mean, so there's, there are built, there seems to me there are a lot of built intentions in how to get this information and un unknowns about how to get this information into the hands of people. You know, we've done, we've done uh, focus groups, we've done marketing campaigns, we've done, you know, Facebook ads, you know, all of, all of that stuff. And I think part of the problem is that, so, so part of the problem is that students, young, the younger students, like they, oh yeah, political science. I mean, I became a political science major because I couldn't get an appointment with a history advisor, right? And here, you know, like I was, I mean, I was a distinguished political scientist, certified by the, by the state of New York. Uh, <laughs> but, but like, I mean, that was just an accident, right? Uh, so, I mean, we, you know, so, so we, we, we need to get this information out. And the reason that I like the skills discussion rather than the degree discussion is because if we identify marketable skills and, and we could monetize them, we could tell a student who's major, who, and we've done this by the way, you know, someone who wants to major in musical theater. And we say, well, if you combine musical theater with a business degree, you could run your own theater. Yeah, but they want to be in, music, in, in theater. Uh, another question. Wait, um, woman on the aisle and then the gentleman right in the same row. Good morning, Nora Carroll from Emergent Inc. This is for any of the panelists. Has there been any use or investigation of prior learning assessment techniques, not just to move people through the programs by getting equivalency credit, but to assess and quantify skills to help bridge that gap? I feel like I've been taking a crash course in PLA in the last couple months because I've been hearing about it every place I've talked to. But then you could talk to it. <laughs> <laughs> No, uh, seriously, I mean, I, I, I don't know the answer to that. I, I think it's less involved in, in, this, in, in the pure, I mean, there are, no, I think people come in specifically with PLA skill, with skill, with more for skills than for maybe the soft skills kinds of things, but it's not well used. It's one of the biggest things I heard, one of the biggest issues I heard in the course of my reporting on some of this adult, um, adult student pro problem out there. The problem not being the adult student, the problem being the institutions and the structures around them. Um, it's not well. It's not very well used. It's not well, very well accepted. I think there's a lot of interest in developing better strategies for that. Did you have something? I, mean, I think the the thing I would just add to that, um, you know, as as you pointed out, um, prior learning assessment right now is oriented toward um, how people can transfer in and and do a full degree program. Um, at the end of the day, one of the things we find in the associates report is uh, that. Um, it's relatively scant people, uh, number of people who actually not only make that transition but also complete. And so to some extent I would sort of rewind the tape and say how do we make sure that at each stage along the process people are accruing skills that have um, immediate value. Um, and you know, again, the difference between um, good outcomes and bad outcomes in many cases is just um, a relatively uh, limited number of skills, we can start orienting um, success to pair career progression with learning or vice versa, um, then uh, you know, I think we will we'll be able to, to crack that cycle uh, more effectively. The gentleman right there, yeah. And then we'll get to Carol. Uh, Stefan Bielski, Professions on Purpose. To what extent did you disaggregate the data of the liberal arts? In other words, uh, for example, I saw my history professors were much tougher on my writing than my English professors were, and I imagine you know, hi, you know, philosophy is a bit more rigorous than ethnic studies, just as chemistry is more rigorous than environmental science. So, to what degree did you see that? Break that down. Well, that was you're stepping into so, dangerous territory. Yeah, right now. I didn't realize that. I, 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 go home so, or go so, broke. And, and the secondly, of, the one, and, 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 and just a, a related point. Um, yeah. <laughs> We're humans. <laughs> to what degree did, um, do, do you think those, those particular choice of majors 
do they attract particular students, or secondly, do they actually impart particular skills, or do they signal to employers? So let me um, let me let me try to kick a couple of. There's a couple of questions there. I'm going to try to unpack them the best I recall. Um, but let me start with this. So we did definitely look at different majors within the liberal arts spectrum. Um, and they do, to your point, have different um, earnings over time, different levels of underemployment um, over time. But the general theme is this, is that they're all south of the average um, among earnings and underemployment and, and the like. And so um, you know, while you can sort of get into a relative debate as to whether it's better to be a classicist or an English major, um, the end of the day, the real question is, what do you do about them? And all of them need um, some, some augmentation or some ways to help students be more successful. Um, I think that gets to the second set of questions, which um, I think really the answer um, in my mind is that, you know, we need to, be, you know, which is I think sort of questions of, of rigor and what, what they teach. I think the real question, or, or sorry, you know, to what extent there's self-selection bias. I think that was your question, right? right. Um, so, you know, as I sort of think about that, there may well be. We certainly, you know, didn't try to solve for that. But what we can say is this, that um, it, no matter what choices you make, and I think this is one of the, the things we, that I think was, that's really important to emphasize here, um, you aren't, you aren't signing a death warrant for your, for your career. Um, so if you decide to be a classicist or a feminist anthropologist or whatever it may be, um, there are still lots of opportunities um, for you. And many of those opportunities um, can come to be quite well-earning, um, in some cases actually better than, uh, than you would do if you came out with a very applied STEM major. Um, but there's a level of awareness that is required of what those opportunities are, how you can pursue them, and um, what are the specific skills that you need to be able to learn and then signal in order to get there. And the good news is, again, in uh, many cases, these are there's not we're not talking about huge um, chasms that need to be bridged. Um, learning something like social media skills. Um, unlocks about 100,000 jobs and about a $9,000 wage premium. Um, learning um, statistical skills uh, you know, can unlock um, even greater potential. I'll give you an example there. Um, a psychologist, uh, someone who does a, a bachelor's in psychology, and it's sort of an interesting field, right? Because you know, there's a general view that psychology is a pre-professional major. Um, but the reality is, is that most psychology majors don't go on to complete graduate studies. Um, the average psychology major makes about um, uh, $42,000. Um, and they often get this sort of uh, advice of, hey, go and, and get uh, a marketing minor or something like that, because you know, you'll understand consumer psychology. Um, you make $39,000. Um, on the other hand, um, if in the course of your psychology work you take um, a course in survey research or something like that where you're doing a little bit of statistical experimentation, you pick up R or SAS, you're going to be making in the 60s right out of college, right? So that's, I think, sort of the essence, uh, a great illustration of what this is all so, about. So let's grab one more question just to keep uh, Carol um, over there, um, and then, because then we're going to have to cut it off in a minute. President of the Association of American Carol, Colleges. Carol, like Oh, sorry. I was president of the Association of American Colleges and Universities. Now I'm with Lumina Foundation as a fellow. Uh, both organizations have in common that they've been working for many years to, for precisely what you've been talking about, um, the hybridization, bringing together the big picture, strong analytical, problem-solving strengths of the liberal arts with the applied learning strengths of all the professional and career fields. And I would suggest to you, Mark, that the best way to get students to pay attention to this is to find institutions which are already putting together, and there are many of them, these blends of broad learning and specialized learning. I think we're going to hear from a few of those next, actually. Yeah. So if, what's your question, Carol? So uh, it's really not so much a question. It's just saying <laughs> no, that, um, um, well, would you agree? That, uh, <laughs> <laughs> would you agree with the point I'm about to make, which is that focusing all our earnings effort on what you majored in is missing the point. <laughs> which is to help students plan a, de a degree that includes both what you're calling those foundational skills, 
but also the broad learning and also some practical skills that they can actually use. That's uh, from Stanford, we're getting from students the notion that it's your mission, not your major. And that's what I heard you saying in your own language. So, uh, okay, so the answer is yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, but actually, so part of the problem is that, um, is that we tend to focus more on like elite institutions than on the, the places that students go, right? So 75% of students are in no-name regional campuses and... Um, Actually, they all have names. <laughs> no <laughs> reputation, like, uh, they all have names, thank you. And, and some of them are like compass campuses, right? They all have north and west. And so so the, one of the advantages that I, that I have with working with the states is that, you know, these state departments of higher education, for example, are, you know, they, they, they're just not doing UT, right, Austin. They're doing the entire UT system. They're doing, you know, not just a, uh, uh, Texas A&M at, at College Station, the entire system, all, yeah, and all the community colleges and all the dozens upon dozens of, of regional campuses. So it's really, for me, it's always been like, you know, People at UT Austin are going to do fine. People at you know, like people at, at at the elite schools are going to do fine. You know, I don't even care about them, quite frankly. They're just going to do fine. But the but trying to get this message to the you know the seventy five percent of undergraduates that go to named but unknown regional campuses. <laughs> thank you. Unknown uh, in the elite circles of Washington, but very well known and important in their communities. Well, but yeah, but that's where the students are. These are the workhorses of American higher education. The kind of messaging that we're talking about, we have to not only get to students, but the, inter but the universities themselves, and what kind of changes need to be done in those universities and in the community colleges, which are split between you know, the, the half that does the AA degrees and the half that does the career and technical education. Well, we need to figure out, schools need to figure out how, 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 what structural changes need to be you done. You can, 30 seconds, because that's a perfect segue to our next panel. I, I said it up that way. So <laughs> just the, the one cautionary note, I want to just make sure, because um, one, one takeaway might be, hey, look, don't, don't worry about this. Um, you know, you don't need to think about what you major in and the value um, that it com confers. Um, at one level, I certainly agree that no matter what you major in, um, there's ways to make that um, into a successful track. Um, but I also want to point out, Mark was talking before about the importance of advising um, and about making conscious decisions as you go. Um, right now, um, Mark pointed to the, the, um, the Strata Gallup study um, on dissatisfaction with advising. And I think a lot of the way that advising happens today is really not so different from the advice Dustin Hoffman gets in The Graduate of yeah. you know, Plastics. Yeah. Um, today we'd probably say go into to, to tech. Um, yeah. But it's, it's probably not much more thoughtful than that. Um, we need to make sure that students have the tools and the information to um, develop a plan to, uh, to not only pursue that which is beautiful and true in the, in, in the world, um, but to also um, acquire the kinds of skills that will make sure um, that they have long-term earning potential and income mobility. A great place to leave it. Um, thank you. Thank you. Please join me in thanking our panel. We're going to take a. You can stand up and stretch your legs, but don't leave because the next panel is coming on in just one in one or two minutes. They're just going to reset the stage here for a second. Thanks very much, everybody.
Ready? Okay, everybody. That was a quick uh, transition there, only a couple of minutes. Um, I'm Jeff Salingo, and it's uh, great to be here at, uh, at the beautiful new headquarters of, uh, of AAI to do, this, uh, to do this panel today. And hopefully, we're going to kind of play off uh, a little bit of the comments from Matt and Mark um, in the previous uh, uh, panel. Uh, we have a great group of, uh, of, of le college leaders with us today. On my immediate right is uh, Cheryl Hyman from the City Colleges of, uh, of Chicago. Um, we have Carol Quillen, uh, from, uh, president of uh, Davidson College, um, and Monty Sullivan from the Louisiana Community and Technical uh, College System. Much like the last panel, I'm going to engage them, hopefully, in a dynamic conversation uh, for uh, the next uh, half hour, 40 minutes or so, and then uh, we'll open it up. Uh, to questions uh, from the from the group, so I want to start. Uh, since the last panel started with the uh, associate's degree, I want to start with Cheryl and Monty on something. So Mark uh, talked a lot about the um, the associate's degree. Many students go to community college thinking they're going to transfer, uh, end up uh, earning an associate's degree. Uh, perhaps ending up earning an associate's degree, but then don't transfer, and that associate's degree thus doesn't have much currency in the in the job market. So, is is what we're trying to do here? Is it more about getting those associate degree earners to transfer, or those associate degree students to transfer to a four year program, or is it more about incorporating needed skills in the associate's degrees, knowing that they're not going to perhaps transfer, or is it a mix of both? Like, what's the goal here? More transfers, more skills, or a combination of both? Um, so, Jeff, I would say it's a combination of both. Okay. I think, uh, for me, what it was about during my time at City Colleges is ensuring that every degree was relevant to the labor market demands, whether that meant a student was going to go right into the labor force right after they left city colleges or whether that meant that their career choice required them to transfer. Whichever option, it meant having more built-in labor market skills into all of our degrees so that there was no loss of forward momentum regardless of either path uh, or that they chose. And I sort of use this as a, forking me a forcing mechanism uh, for us to try to minimize credit loss okay. and minimize momentum. So it, it, it's about ensuring relevancy within all of your degree programs, minimizing credit loss, and uh, minimizing the loss of forward momentum. Yeah. So Monty, what's your goal down in so, Louisiana? You know, one of the things that we found in the Louisiana uh, Community and Technical College is uh, largely a first-generation community uh, technical college serving institutions. Yeah, could, could, many of our but, students, I'm sorry, just sure. could you level set us on, on a little bit about the institutions. How many, sure. how many students you serve? So we're, we're 130,000 students, uh, 12 institutions. A okay. uh, little bit of background. Um, we, we lost uh, about $80 million over about a 10-year period, the largest disinvestment in public dollars in higher education. Uh, at the same time, we doubled in tuition. So what that force from a market perspective is to be more relevant to the point you made a second ago than ever before because it is truly about the value proposition to the student. Uh, most of those 130,000 students come to us with a background as first generation college students. Many of their parents have encouraged them to pursue the baccalaureate degree because obviously as first generation college students these parents want more for the next generation than they had. So they see the baccalaureate degree as being the answer. The reality though is that the marketplace has changed around us. And so while oftentimes in higher education we focus down and in into the institution, it really is about looking up and out uh, from those colleges to determine the relevance of what we offer. So it is truly about those skills. Uh, I think many of these students are completing credentials, uh, regardless of whether it be the Associate of Arts or technical credentials, in order to be able to go and go to work. That doesn't mean the baccalaureate degree isn't valuable and that they may not pursue it at some point. Uh, what we are seeing is the more technical the curriculum offered at a college, the older the average student population. Average age 27. Isn't that kind of interesting? Uh, the other thing that I think is, is really important uh, for all of us is that education has changed around us in the sense that it is much more iterative today than ever before. 
Most of us pursued baccalaureate degrees as a four year, some of it stretched it into five or six, um, <laughs> opportunity. Oftentimes what we're seeing is adults coming in and picking up skills and then going out and working for a period of time, returning to the college, ultimately earning that baccalaureate degree, particularly if they pursue, like the machinist, uh, the BA degree in order to move into management. I, I wanna get back into that kind of short spurt uh, stuff in a second. So uh, Carol, I wonder if this, uh, this focus on skills um, if there's something that can be learned from the uh, liberal arts college, four-year liberal arts college sector. You know, I remember writing about this right back during the Great Recession, talking about skills at liberal arts colleges, and presidents would call me and say, you know, we're about the fifth job, we're not about the first job. Yeah. That has changed a lot in the last decade. In fact, it's probably, I always tell people now that I think liberal arts colleges are further ahead than most institutions around thinking about skills. What can be learned? You know, you, you've been at now Davidson for quite some time and you've launched a lot of efforts there around your transition to impact work. What, what can other sectors of higher education learn from what liberal arts colleges have done in the last decade around kind of connecting their broad education, which is kind of their hallmark, to this skills uh, conversation we're having today? Uh so in terms of what, what we've done at Davidson, thank you for the question, and what I think liberal arts colleges are distinctively equipped to do, in full disclosure, Davidson is you know, an elite institution. It's, 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 it's a highly selective institution. It's hard to get in. And so in some sense, more Mark said, your students are going to be fine. In some sense, that's true. Nonetheless, we need to take much more responsibility than we ever have in the past for moving our students from our campus into the world of work. Right? That, and we call that transition to impact at Davidson. We did a bunch of things. We changed our advising entirely. And this is one place where I think we can provide a model mm -hmm. for other institutions. So we changed our advising system to a much more holistic approach. We hired someone to run career development from outside of higher education. She came to us from State Street. She knows the corporate world. She works on a different time scale. She has road maps, maps for every, every year. So first year student, here's your road maps. Seventh year student, here's your road map. We focused much more on ensuring that our students had work experience, largely through internships, that they'd all done original problem solving, demonstrated either through original research in the lab or a project in the community, and that they all could demonstrate cultural competency, that they'd worked in multicultural environments, either by international work or in an environment where they could learn how to manage a, a pluralistic and multicultural work environment. And those are things for, that employers look for. The challenge is, is creating a credential that actually, and this is where I, I agree on the, the focus on skills, how do you create a credential that reflects that? So for example, if you're an, an anthropology major and for your senior project, you've worked with a huge regional hospital system to help analyzing their patient data to try to figure out how they can most efficiently and effectively manage a chronic disease across, a, across multiple populations and a big geographical area. You've demonstrated data analytic skills. You've demonstrated cultural competence. You probably know how to interview people. You've, you've uh, got communication skills because you had to communicate this back to your sponsor for the research. But what your degree will say is anthropology. So, so I, I'm interested in thinking through the ways in which credentials can better reflect skills acquired. And I say... I'm sorry, so, I'm sorry. So is it so, time to do away with majors then? So uh, what I would say is um, liberal arts colleges are not about field. And this is a little pet peeve, I apologize. But the number of, in the top five majors at Davidson are biology, math, and economics. So liberal arts is an approach to education that, stre that stresses both breadth and focus. And the advantage that that confers on a student is that our students can analyze complicated problems from multiple perspectives, that they can use analytical frameworks derived from math, from computer science, from economics, from anthropology, from history, and look at a hard problem. How do we make healthcare good and affordable and come up with a new way to think about it? That's the advantage of the approach we take. It's an approach to education, not a field. Hmm. So liberal arts colleges have dramatically expanded as the field of inquiry has expanded to add computer science. Some have even added engineering. Swarthmore has an engineering program. So it's, I think, looking to liberal arts colleges for the approach to education 
especially at a time when these hybrid skills, orthogonal right. skills, are, are important. Can you talk, can you, do you have cross-cultural competency and you can analyze a big data set? There's a way to structure a credential that would indicate how the course of study had achieved all of that. Okay, and so, I, so I understand, and this is a question for all of you, I understand we need a curriculum, right? And, mm -hmm. But why do we have to structure everything within a program? If it is about skills, right, it seems like why do we have to structure, I, you know, I have to pick a major, I have mm -hmm. to pick a program. Again, understanding that there has to, you have to follow a curriculum and you can't just pick so and choose and have a, a random collection of stuff that at the end equals a degree. But are we, how, it seems like we're, we're in one camp here in terms of majors and programs, and it seems like most colleges have set up majors largely because it's a way to organize the faculty. Um, and then on the other end, we heard in the previous panel, it's about skills. So how can we better, how can we better meet in the middle so that we're not too far on this one side that it's about programs? So Jeff, I think that's a great question, but I think it brings up uh, something that's a pet peeve uh, of mine, and I'm not so sure I'm so apologetic about uh, mine. We're trying to develop new outcomes within old delivery models and old frameworks mm -hmm. is basically what we're doing. And so we're talking a lot about outcomes. We're talking a lot about credentialing. We're talking a lot about majors versus not majors. But in a lot of cases, it's not the institutions themselves that actually control the structures and the delivery models in which we operate in. There needs to be uh, far more of a push on our governing and regulatory bodies that actually do have the authority to change some of these delivery models, some of these uh, frameworks, and some of these infrastructures in which we operate in. I have the same questions. I don't think we need, you know, a lot of uh, majors anymore. Um, I agree with a lot of the panelists. I'm so incredibly uh, honored to be here with Carol, who, you know, I think she was at a liberal arts, I was at a large urban institution, and you hear both of us talk and it really puts an end to this false debate uh, or this lazy, lazy argument or, or this false dichotomy about you know liberal arts versus technical. They both complement each other. But my pet peeve right now is how do we change delivery models, how do we change infrastructures, and how do we change policies to be more reflective okay. of the outcomes that we're advocating? I, I want to get back to delivery models in a second, Monty or Carol. Uh, this idea of should it be more skills-based, less major-based? I, I think it's, it's certainly not a, not a dichotomy, that's for, that's for certain. There, there are opportunities, I think, and the work that's gone on at Davidson is, uh, is extraordinary. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and when you think about how you pull those two sides together and really sort of answer the question for the individual student, uh, there was a point in time in this country where higher education, uh, there was a bit of a monopoly. It was held by institutions. That is no longer the case. In fact, this past year, 24,000 students graduated from our colleges. 11,000 credentials that were completed were industry-based certifications. Okay. Nearly one half. Now, that demonstrates to you that, that, that students are voting with their feet. They're moving toward the economy. Uh, and the entire discussion around student success in this nation of pushing students through programs is, is really wrong-headed. It's about the economic pull that pulls students through completion, particularly right. for the older student. I believe that is also the case in, in the baccalaureate degree uh, levels as well. Those skill sets that can be developed, you know, you talked about data analysis, perhaps it's specific software certifications that help that student to have a broader uh, perspective and application within the market. Uh, the thought processes that go into it, uh, I think apply whether you're talking about the associate degree level, the baccalaureate degree level. Uh, the ability to think critically is a skill set you'll hear from every employer, regardless of the, the level that, uh, that they are pursuing, uh, you know, uh, the, the employee. But I think we can learn from one another, and it's one of the areas I really encourage all of you. The community college is uniquely an American invention. And if you think about the role community colleges have played over the last 50 or 60 years, the rest of higher education can learn a thing or two from what our community colleges have done in this nation. Even though some may want to change the name to vocational institutions, <laughs> uh, I would have to say to you what's in a name, uh, but we, we do offer a great deal to, to cause uh, our, our higher education colleagues to look up and out into the community. Yeah, I, uh, go ahead, I, Carol, and then I want to get back to Monty on something. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I would ag agree with that. I think the post-secondary educational sector is very differentiated. It is a highly differentiated sector without, uh, without the complexity of credentials to match. 
so, so that if we could figure out a way to have, and you know, full disclosure, I am on the board of Credential Engine, but if we could figure out a way to, um, to, to have both differentiation and transparency, that would be really fantastic. A BA degree, if someone has a bachelor, that tells you very little about the person, about what the person knows, about, it tells you very little. The major, I would argue, tells you very little, precisely because of the example I just gave. So we need a better way to signal what it is our students have demonstrably learned how to do, um, and, and, to, and, to, and to communicate with employers and work with them about, about what they think is important. I do think that advising is crucial. And that's where I think both community colleges and liberal arts colleges have tried hard to help mm -hmm. students figure out what it is they want to do from the, from the first day. And, and it might not be you know, towards a particular job. For us, it's you know, where do you want to make your mark? You know, where does what you're good at match what the world needs? And how are you going to live out this life of leadership and service in the so world? So that's all fine and good, Carol. But you know, I, I, I've talked to a lot of graduates of all kinds of liberal arts colleges, including Davidson, who say they get to their, they picked a major thinking it might lead to certain kinds of jobs. They get to their senior year, they start applying for jobs, and there's all these job titles out there they didn't even know existed, right? right. A lot of the hybrid jobs that Matt was talking about earlier, right? right? Uh, and they didn't know that they existed four years earlier, and they wish they did. Uh, or maybe they didn't exist four years earlier. Right, so how, <laughs> maybe they didn't. Right, so how do we, can you talk a little bit more in detail about advising? Like, what, what, what types of advising needs to happen now much earlier on to help so that students, when they do get to that final year of college, they're better prepared for the job market? So we, what, what I think is required is a holistic approach to advising. Okay. That is to say, not a split between academic advising and career advising and you know, wellness advising and, and other kinds of advising. So we've developed a, a training program for all advisors at Davidson. And you, are, you stick with your advisees, your cohort. I have some for two years. And it's your responsibility to make sure that in their first year, they know where the Career Development Center is. They've made an appointment. They've picked up the, the materials they need to know about study abroad. They've, they've registered for the um, uh, database we have around internships. They've connected with a Davidson alum who can help them get the internships that they want. It's a much broader structure of advising than simply do you have the courses you need to meet the requirements for your major. And, and, and that approach allows for opportunities to say, hey, you want to do theater and data science. Why don't you do a data science minor to go along with your theater? So Monte Jiro, I mean, that's a model that's hard to replicate given your scale, right? So how can, how can you provide that type of uh, holistic advising to, to your students? So I think there's a certain amount of advising that's going to come from human interaction, but there's a certain amount of advising you should allow for self-service for your students. Mm -hmm. So just like we have data warehouses and analytic centers where we can go and try to figure out what the labor market demand is, we should have those same uh, mechanisms, those same uh, things available for our students to be able to go and look at. And so we did a, once we knew what our region, what labor market data would look like and what would dominate our region over the next decade, we structured all of our informational systems that our students interact with, with that information. So our students could go on, on our website at any given time and look at the seven industries in which we were focused on and look at all of the particular jobs that would dominate that region, uh, what it would take in order to succeed, uh, the pathway that they would have to uh, go along within our institution, what their uh, estimated earnings would be. And so it, it's hard to think that one advisor, particularly in an institution where when I started as chancellor, my advisor to student, uh, my student to advisor ratio was as high as 950 to <laughs> one. So good luck, you know, advising any student yeah. uh, appropriately. And even with all my investments, when I got it down to 300 and uh, 50 to one, that's still too much. And that's, un that's an unrealistic burden to put on an advisor. So you have to create uh, data analytic 
uh, transparency, warehouses where students can go and get that information themselves and they can get it much sooner than when they show up at your door. They should be making those decisions very early on. So we have to figure out, as much as we as institutions need to figure out how to access data and analyze data better, we need to be teaching that to our students and making that available to them as well. Monty, again, how do you, how do, you do this type of advising at scale? So the, the Davison example really is what we refer to as sort of the shepherd approach, okay. which is a, a, given, a given program head, as an example, has that responsibility to move those students through to completion, uh, not just completion of the credential or, or multiple credentials, but to employment. It really is about the relationship between the program leaders and the employment market. Uh, so that students begin to see the program not for the credential, but for the leveraging the relationship that the institution and the faculty member has with the local employment market. Uh, so that a, a given uh, company, a great example, Swella Technical Community College is in the southwest part of Louisiana, major investment going on in the, in the um, natural gas sector. Sasol, major international firm, has invested $8 billion in that community. Probably is the largest workforce demand market in the nation. What you're beginning to see is this company every Monday orients its new employees on the college campus. And so in the community's mind, they think of, if I want to go to work at Sasol, I now know that the front door to Sasol is at Sowella Technical Community College. Yeah. That is a very different approach than a degree or a credential. It is not about the college. It is not even about the structure of the credential. It is instead about uh, allowing me to leverage that college to get into the job market. And so the information that happens on the front end typically is the college, because of the cuts that we've experienced, because of the financial circumstance of our colleges, we don't have the luxury of offering programs that aren't aligned with the labor market. Our menu has gone from this broad to this broad. And so as a result of that, we've been able to kind of see over the horizon a bit. And I think this is part of that model that we should be considering. Very difficult to do in an institution like Davidson that has a much broader footprint. But as regional universities, as we were talking about a few minutes ago, are more focused on those regional uh, economies, I think it's an appropriate model. Yeah. So can I'm going to be going to uh, questions in the, uh, in the audience in a, in, in a second. Um, I'm sorry, Carol, did you have something just, to add? I mean, I, I think that this notion of looking up and out and helping students lower, uh, erase really the border that they see between what they do in a classroom and what they're going to do in the world so that it, it's a, you're helping them structure a meaningful life, right? And if they can understand that, then some of these, the walls they build in their minds between this class and a job disappear and they are looking up and out and always thinking about what's next. I want, to, uh, I want to go back to credentials for a second because there's been such a focus in this country uh, on the completion agenda, on, on credentials, that that completion agenda has expanded to talk more than just about degrees, talk about certificates. But you know, we were talking even before this panel, I, I recently did a story out in uh, Iowa for the Atlantic around job retraining. And, and, and one of the biggest growths that they're seeing at their community college is in non-credit uh, work um, because the completion of those students is much higher than in the credit work because they're short term, right? right? So, and it's enough to get them in a job, right? right? So it might be six weeks, it might be 12 weeks. It, it, it gets them in a job, they retroactively could go back for credit. They could then start stacking uh, uh, credits together, eventually get a degree. Um, let's talk, so let's talk a little bit about that delivery. We've been talking earlier about uh, non-credit work. Should that be, should we think more about that? I mean, non-credit work was always kind of pushed aside in higher education as not, Serious as not, well, it's not relevant because it doesn't necessarily lead to anything, but, but we're starting to see real results in the job market that, you know, a six-week program is enough to get somebody, again, that job or get them promoted, and then they're going to continue to come back for that lifelong learning. Sure. Many, many of the students that we serve, about 23,000 of the, the 130,000 are what we would call in the higher ed speak non-credit. The reality is the market really cares less whether there's credit or non-credit. We are the yeah. ones who value credit. Yeah. Not the students, not the employers. The employers are looking for the skills. They're looking exactly. for the credential. And so, uh, as I mentioned a second ago, about 11,000 industry-based certifications completed. About half of those were completed in a non-credit kind of environment, as we would call it. And so, many of those already held baccalaureate degrees. So, imagine for a second that you have a major IT firm that locates in, in a, a, a city uh, like Baton Rouge that didn't have a, a, a market of a large market of uh, those folks with backgrounds in the IT fields. They're looking now to liberal arts graduates who then with a six week coding boot camp at one of our colleges walks out with certifications 
and they're able to go to work, and that has become the model employee that they're looking for for onboarding. Not the computer science graduate, not the engineering graduate. They're now looking for that broader thought that comes from the liberal arts degree along with the technical skills. So I think the overarching point here that I would make to you is this. It is not a decision of is it technical education or is it liberal arts education. It's both. Oftentimes it's the technical credential that gets you in the door and it's the liberal arts background that allows you to remain and progress in the career. So Jeff, if I can say a couple things. we. Um, I, I have to say this because I've heard a lot about soft skills and yep. that's another one of those buzzwords that we've started to use a lot. Um, and I wish we could come up with a better name for it. Yeah, <laughs> it, it's, it, I think as it relates to soft skills, when we talk about that, we really need to understand what specific employers are talking about what they mean and what they're looking for when they say that. We have this assumption that when we say the word soft skills, it's automatically only related to a liberal arts degree. Now, I have a bachelor's, personally have a bachelor's of science in computer science. I would like to think that, <laughs> that I did learn how to think critically and how to problem solve while pursuing that. We put that in the soft skills category, but we still don't relate soft skills to technical degrees when we say that. So when we talk about soft skills, let's make sure we're understanding what each specific employer needs. But what's important to me is that every single program, degree or not, has the right mix of cognitive, non-cognitive, soft skills and uh, social skills and technical skills. Right. As it relates to credit versus non-credit, here's another example of us trying to uh, fit our new approaches into an old infrastructure and old delivery system. So right now, as uh, Monty pointed out, credit hour serves as a currency uh, and validates certain learning outcomes or supposed to signal uh, certain learning outcomes. And so at the end of the day, employers and four-year institutions will want a shorthand for something that represents the currency of the learning and the skills that they're looking for. Why do we have to still call it credit hour? Why are we still operating uh, within that framework? And that's not necessarily what's relevant. So again, this is less about the control of the institution. And I think we need to start putting far more pressure on our regulating uh, entities and our governing bodies to get out of their old habits and old ways of thinking and adopt to the new world so Monty doesn't have to award so many non-credit uh, uh, credentials that are really relevant uh, to employers and foreign I, institutions. I, I also tend to think we, we blame higher ed a little bit too much yeah. uh, uh, for this. I, I think employers sometimes don't necessarily know what they want. A, a great story years ago I, I, on a panel like this I so A.G. Lafley, who at that time was the CEO of P&G, um, graduated from Hamilton College, a great uh, liberal arts college in upstate New York, actually wanted to be a college professor, talking about the liberal arts. Uh, a couple months later, I meet a, a recruiter for P&G on a college campus uh, at, at a Big Ted school looking just for engineering degrees. And as she said, it's all fine and good. The CEO says that but he's not hiring people entry level jobs, right? He's, I'm looking for somebody with a specific set of skills. So mm -hmm. here you have one employer. So when we say what employers want, I think it mm -hmm. also depends on who you ask, exactly. right? Do you ask yeah. the chief HR person? Do you ask the CEO? Exactly. Right. Do you ask the person exactly. doing the day-to-day -day hiring? Exactly. So, the, so to me, the, the problem is, is that the term liberal arts doesn't convey anything. No. And it doesn't tell, it, does, it says nothing about a field. It says nothing about a major. It ought to convey this combination of breadth and focus, mm -hmm. but it doesn't. And so until we, well, there's so much category confusion in how we talk about this, until mm -hmm. we figure out a better way to describe the, the, the lay of the land, I think it's gonna be really difficult to arrive at, at to see what the paths forward are. So it, it, I, the, the question of whether students continue to pursue a major is less important than the association we tend to have between the major and the career. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's where the skills issue is so important to me. And we, we're the, gonna end with this line, then we're gonna open it up for questions. On the soft skills front, uh, I would just encourage you to think about it in terms of work ethic. 
Uh, when, when we talk with employers, employers said to us, it's not soft skills, don't use that term, because that implies something that is uh, sort of less than, particularly in construction mm -hmm. fields and hard science fields. Mm -hmm. They think of those as somehow being less than. And so instead, they were able to put together with us, roll up their sleeves, take a look at what are the work ethic elements that they're looking for employees. And ultimately, our colleges have been able to, do, to develop an, a part of the transcript that grades students on a one to five scale of attendance, of communication, of ability to work in teams, all of the things that employers are saying to us. So imagine the value of the transcript now has just gone up exponentially because they're not just looking at A to F grades, they're now looking at the real work ethic kinds of skills that they're looking for for employment. Terrific. Okay, we'll start over here. Microphone's coming to you. It's not more, there we go. <laughs> Monica Her Committee for Economic Development, and I think this whole discussion about skills and how, um, how uh, schools communicate and students communicate what they've learned is, is just very key, and I would say that's really the unit that we should be dealing with. And so my question is, um, what, you know, I went on to graduate school, so I, I took the GRE, and so at that point in time, basically, it was assessed, you know, my level of skills in math and language skills and so on. And what I don't understand is for um, undergraduate institutions, why don't you assess and create, when your students end, you know, as Matt was saying, there's an identifiable set of foundational skills. We may argue about the names and the exact number, but why aren't schools assessing the people who are leaving their doors on those skills? Because that's what employers care about, and then you can, you know, they can mix and match and, you know, hire the people they want that, you know, Okay, so I, I mean, some schools levels. do this, right? They use yeah. the collegiate learning exam uh, and things like that. I mean, are, there are tools to do this. Sure, I think, you know, in, not just on the liberal arts side or, or the, what, what we might think of as the general education core, but more broadly, that's what industry-based certifications really are. Most of those industry-based certifications consisted of an exam that validated the skills that you, that you know. Uh, so, you know, I had an opportunity to interview in, in focus groups about 250 employers all across Louisiana and ask the question of how do you determine quality? And I expected to hear things like accreditation and curriculum and all the other things that we know are sort of the down and in part of higher education. And their response was real simple. If we pay them and they sustain employment over a period of time, there's a quality there. And you can measure that quality based upon earnings. And so if you, if you apply that then backward, to some of the assessment elements, I do think there's a way for us to demonstrate the value through assessment. Uh, the, the concern that I have is, is that uh, we can't become much like our K-12 uh, colleagues over-assessed. Uh, in fact, yeah. the accountability uh, movement right. that has really taken over this country has, has killed career and technical education oftentimes in our K-12 school systems. I think we have to be careful. Uh, one, okay. Yeah, go ahead, so and then there's a question. One here. quick thing I would say is that it's difficult to assess to disaggregate and assess skills when what often matters is one's ability to understand how to deploy them in complicated real world contexts. So from, from my perspective, you know, your ability to do a particular kind of math problem, like that I took from Jerry as well a long time ago, do particularly to, so to solve those problems is different from confronting a real world, very complicated problem and knowing what to do in that instance. And so for me, the project-based approach where, you're, where students are, are actually addressing and solving really complicated problems is a better way to demonstrate their ability to do that in life as opposed to you know, the, you know, the swimming stroke question that we ought to answer on the GREs. Which is why internships and co-op right. learning has become mm -hmm. such a, uh, a method for uh, employers to hire, right? right? Exactly. They, because it's a, it's a way to test those skills in right. real life right. over a couple of and, months. Yeah. Right. Can you get your sponsor to accept yeah. the research that you've created? Do you right. have that right. ability to persuade? Right. You know? right. Exactly. It, Yeah, I mean, I, I guess the other concern is that will, will students take those assessments seriously yeah. at the end of college? Uh, I mean, the question I think the CLA uh, 
thinks about. So go ahead. Thank you. My name is Joe Kwong. I'm with the Philanthropy Roundtable. And my question to you is you, you're all on the, um, involved with really system shifts and real innovation. What can donors do to help mm -hmm. further a, a shift, question. the kinds of shifts that you okay. think are important? And if possible, to drill down even more, what advice would you give to a donor who wanted to get started uh, in making an investment? Oh, very good question. <laughs> I, love all three of you. <laughs> I love this question. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe so there's some donors I, listening. Right. <laughs> I had a very different, when I uh, was at City Colleges, I had a very different approach to donors. Uh, much of which my colleagues didn't understand. But one, I did not want to, uh, I didn't approach donors very much. Uh, one, because I felt like there was enough efficiencies for us to drive out of our own organization. And so until I felt like we had drove those efficiencies out of our organizations and could clearly articulate that to donors, then why should you make an investment uh, in us? But I also wanted to have a real plan of investment for donors to invest in. So I wanted a long-term plan uh, that was structured around quantifiable, measurable goals so that you could know what your return on your investment would be. I would highly encourage donors to demand that from institutions prior to them donating. So a lot of times donors will donate to an initiative or they would encourage an initiative. And so you'll find institutions involved in initiative overload that's not really leading to systematic, systemic change of our institutions. I would say take a different approach. Demand a, a strategic plan that has quantifiable, me measurable goals that will increase student success and outcomes for the institutions and invest in that plan and then allow them the creativity to change. And, and try to drive, drive change that way. Uh, Carol and Monty, thoughts so, on this? I would say um, look for things not, that are not only scalable, but that are replicable. replicable. Scalability mm -hmm. is... So these is, are all three things that donors do, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, but, yeah. But, so I would say scalability and replicability are different, and often you can pilot something that would be replicable, but, but that for whatever reason is not scalable in the conventional sense. Right. The second thing I would say is it really makes a difference that we make edu equal educational opportunity real for everybody. That is a huge, huge issue, mm -hmm. and I think when we change the people who are asking the questions, we'll change the solution. So for, for me, making sure that our doors are open to all talented kids, respective of their financial circumstances or where they're from, is the top priority for actually making change in the kind of research we produce. You know, Joe, great question. I would, I would just you know, to go back to what Cheryl has said a couple of times now, and that is about changing the rules. Uh, and, and you as foundations have opportunities to help change the rules. Uh, we've, we've had a discussion now uh, with a number of, the, of those folks on the Hill about this notion of Pell for non-credit or workforce-related programs. As a classic example, the market around us is changing. How do we apply that? So I encourage you to, to be engaged as, you, as you, I know that you are in the advocacy world. The second is to continue to push the notion of the ability to share data because the, the ability to share data, it, it directly relates back to our ability to tell the story. The third point, and I think is, is one that if you looked at every foundation that we can all think of uh, and focus on what it is that those foundations are trying to accomplish, higher education is the answer in every one of those communities. Where we stand today uh, as a nation, I think, is, is on a, a very interesting place because we're trying to now move to what truly is mass education. The high school diploma is no longer the goal. Now we're talking about skills, about credentials, about college education, something beyond high school. Uh, and if you look at those health metrics, if you look at the economic metrics, nearly every aspect of what foundations are focused on today can be changed and are changed demonstrably through post-secondary education. Great question. Uh, we'll move over onto this side and then come back. So right here. Excuse me. Oh, sorry. Hi, Sean Riley for, with the American Council of Trustees and Alumni. So um, from donors to trustees, right? Uh, <laughs> what, uh, what can trustees do? I mean, in many, many cases, one of the things we do is we, get, we work with trustees to help them kind of understand trends and issues in higher ed and lots of, that they may or may not be sort of plugged into, even though they do have the fiduciary responsibility at these institutions. And many times they're plugged into the business community, so there might be a nice um, sort of connection there, but, you know, there seems to be some kind of disconnect that could be better sort of used. How, could, how can we uh, make that better? I, I, I would say 
that I believe that trustees and trustee organizations can become great advocates uh, to the, the governing bodies and regulating bodies in order to look for changes in policy uh, that's so greatly needed. A lot of time, it's us as leaders who are <laughs> down in front of Congress or down in front of our state legislatures trying to advocate and lobby uh, for change. I think this is a great opportunity and a great area for uh, trustees to uh, get in front of and, and help push that movement in that area. Just a question just over a, here. A oh, I'm sorry, question. do you want to add? Yeah, just a quick response. Uh, to me, the, the fundamental building block of any trustee is understanding the mission. Oftentimes we overlook that and we focus on the fiduciary responsibility or some of the others. But understanding the mission of these institutions, and they are very different across all of the spectrum of higher education, uh, but those trustees need to understand, believe in, and be able to talk about that mission uh, in a way that is compelling to advocates, to you know, a whole range of stakeholders. Okay, we have a question over here, a question over here, come back, and then I have a, a wrap-up question I'll give. So, right here. Yep. Uh, Peter Grace, I'm a current grad student. Um, I found both as an undergrad and presently the best career help I've gotten was from students a year or two ahead of me. I look at them and think, I want to be in that position. Is that part of any of the advisory programs that uh, you're developing and, and working on in your respective institutions? So the idea of peer networking. Yeah, we have, we, sorry, go ahead. No, you go ahead. We have near peer advising in a yeah. range of ways. Um, we have, it, it works for first generation students. It's really important in the sciences to get an early research experience and to hear about that research experience from students who have already done it. So we have a pretty extensive near peer advising system for kids interested in the sciences. And similarly, for um, students, uh, for international students or students who are interested, who's, who's, or are DACA students, whose career trajectories are going to be uh, constrained by things beyond their control, we try to figure out how to get them in touch with near peers. And we use our young alumni a lot, a lot. We have a pretty extensive young alumni network for um, uh, sample interviews or um, job shadowing or any kinds of questions like that. I think there's a formal uh, peer uh, tutoring kind of or, or mentoring kind of network. We have those. But I think what's more interesting to me is the informal network. And I think of it as the, the restaurant business. You, you, you go to a restaurant because someone told you it was really good. You enroll in a program because someone told you this is what worked for me. You see, the average age of our students, again, 27, People at, at that point in life, they have such a thin margin, such a thin cushion in life, they cannot afford to fail. They have to see someone, they're all from Missouri, show me where you started, where you are now, and show me your pay stub, because that's what they're really interested in. So that, that whole restaurant approach is one that has been helpful to us. Okay. Cheryl? So, so I'll, I'll say, uh, having led a large urban community college system, which I am an alum myself, and having grown up in uh, a city like Chicago, I quite often say it's hard for our students to understand that they can be what they cannot see. And so when you have an institute, so whether it's through peer networking or whether they see just great success from other students coming out of their neighborhoods as opposed to what they see on the evening news, that's a huge motivator for the population I was serving. But when I walked into the institution and saw that we had a graduation rate of 7%, I, I was afraid that that was a mechanism I wasn't going to be able to use. And so we community colleges have a unique, very unique opportunity to have a real influence on how young people think about their futures. And so I think that's why I was so passionate about increasing our outcomes, increasing our completion rates, so that students could see that and understand that it is possible through those institutions. Uh, let's go to Carol here, and then we'll end with this question over here after, and then go from here. Uh, so Carol Schneider again, and now I really do have a question, uh, which is, uh, traditionally the liberal arts have of course been connected with the needs of our democracy and our capacity as a society to sustain our democracy. And I don't believe I've heard the word civic or democracy or you came close with cultural competency. Um, if you just say a little bit about where you think things need to go to make sure that we're preparing graduates 
not just as successful navigators of the economy, but also as participants in our democracy? Yeah. Great question. Yeah, great, great question. I would, I would just a uh, very quick response. I, I think uh, part of what we talk about in the community college sector is community colleges are democracy's college. We are oftentimes the institutions that are about mobility, social, economic, uh, a whole range of, of different uh, levels of mobility. But the one thing that has concerned me for, for my entire career in education is this notion that we are shutting out a group of people from our institutions. If you look across the country, community colleges oftentimes have what we call an open admissions function, but yet we require the high school diploma. You know our board over a year ago removed the high school diploma as a requirement, not because we don't believe it's important, but because most of the time the students who didn't complete the high school diploma, it was not academic. It was personal, it was social, it was economic. And so ensuring that those, that those uh, individuals have the access to be able to become a participant in the economy and a participant civically, I think is really important. Uh, we do have some requirements as a state uh, looking at civic related uh, curricula and we do teach those as a part of all of our programs, but it definitely deserves more focus. So at a, at a residential, um at a, re a small residential liberal arts college, the opportunity there is you have this wide range of individuals who have very little in common other than the fact that they're driven and really good students, and you compel them to live together and figure out how they're gonna talk to each other about issues that divide not only them, but the country. And I think it's, it's really, um, it's on us to make sure that all of our students graduate with a kind of robustness to be able to articulate what they believe, to debate in a kind of um, open way and also to be able to have a conversation where the sole object isn't to persuade the other person that you are correct. And, 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 and you know, Davidson's mission is assist students in developing humane instincts, disciplined and creative minds for lives of leadership and service. So those are the kinds of kids that come to us and that leadership and service part includes the ability to sustain a pluralistic democratic society especially now when, the, when, the, when we are in these isolated communities reading curated news and only talking to each other, only talking to people who think exactly as we do. Let's move on to this last question over here. Hi there, uh, I'm Alan Gross at the Washington Center for Internships and Academic Seminars. My question is about credentials and signaling. Uh, all of our credentials are at degree levels. We're program level, we don't have a credential, but we see a lot of the, the skills uh, developing and hybridizing and learning to focus on these things in uh, unscripted environments. Are co-curricular transcripts like Elon University, you know, sort of highlighted by Lumina, or is LinkedIn a better option? What do, what do we, how do we connect the, skills to the signaling? So I think this gets to uh, the point that I, I don't have the answer to the question, but I certainly want to acknowledge the problem. I think this gets to the point that I was making uh, uh, earlier is that the world is moving, but our structures, infrastructures, and delivery models around education is not. So now we can't even figure out how to communicate with one another. Um, how do we, which will make it hard for us to figure out how to place our students. But we have to let go of our old habits and our old ways of thinking. You know, I quite often say when it comes to credentials, you know, we get caught in what I call the alphabet soup debate. You know, should a student get an AA? Should they get an AS? Should they get an AGS? Should, and employers don't care about any of that and half the time don't know what we're talking about. And, and so we have to let go. It's so hard for us to let go of that. So we can't figure out the right answers to these questions that we're struggling with, but it's calling for us to let go of a lot of the old traditional ways of operating. So let's end on this, look into the future. Uh, so uh, Matt uh, was on a, he's the hardest working person this week here in Washington. Uh, uh, he was on a panel earlier this week over at uh, Gallup. Uh, talking about artificial intelligence and, and the future job market. Uh, we've talked a lot about skills that are needed today, maybe needed tomorrow, but we also know the job market's gonna change drastically. The economy is already changing drastically because of artificial intelligence and automation, right? Um, so we have no idea really, unlike in the past, when you kind of could guess where the job market was going, we really have no idea where it's going. So what um, what's the best advice you think you can give to your students given, uh, given all of these predictions about artificial intelligence, 
um, besides go into artificial intelligence, perhaps. Uh, uh, what, what's the best advice you can give to them? Let's end on that. Um, we'll start with Monty and come down. Yeah, I think, I think the, the best advice I could give is, is obviously get the skills for what is immediate, uh, but also get the broad-based education that will allow you to participate in what will be the next economy and the next economy. What we know for certain is that the, the, the technology cycle is narrowing so quickly that more and more technology cycles will happen for the next generation within their work life. And so their ability to adapt and change is absolutely essential. And when you look at the elements of the liberal arts curriculum, the ability to think critically and adapt is, is uh, essential. Great. Thank you. Carol. Say, learn how to learn in disparate fields on your own. On your well own. Said. Well okay. said. Well said. Um, I would say uh, remain constantly informed and seek information for yourself so that you know if others are serving you properly and truly preparing you. I think we really need to encourage students to get as much information about the labor markets and about their future as we are getting in this room. Perfect. Please join me in thanking Monty, Carol, and Cheryl. Thank you very much. And thank you for joining us today. It was nice to I appreciate meet you. it. Great to meet you. Really nice to meet you.